That's okay. So last time when I preached about pregnancy, and we talked about different ways uh, or different reasons why people struggle to get pregnant, because I believe it follows more the law of reaping and sowing rather than uh, blessing and cursing, as some people might. I really should have finished on this point, but I forgot to include it in last sermon. But, you know, just the fact, and, and this is a well-known fact to a lot of uh, Christians that do struggle to get pregnant, the fact that everyone who was barren in the Bible actually ended up giving birth. There isn't a woman in the Bible that is mentioned that she was barren that didn't end up having children. And whilst that may not help necessarily somebody get pregnant uh, who is, is struggling to get pregnant, it is an encouragement to know that God does care and that we have this example throughout the Bible. And I won't turn to all the passages, but I just listed all the people here, if you didn't know who they were, of women that were barren in the Bible but eventually gave birth to a child. Uh, so first of all, we have Sarah, Abraham's wife, uh, who gave birth to Isaac. And I didn't know whether to put this into the category of miraculous because obviously she was past childbearing age. You know, she probably already hit menopause. So was it the fact that she just miraculously conceived or miraculously was able to produce uh, an egg even though she was already past that age? Who knows about the mechanics of it, but we do know that she was barren. Uh, physically, it was impossible for her to have a child, but she ended up giving birth to Isaac. Then we have Isaac and Rebekah. Um, the interesting thing about Isaac and Rebekah is that Isaac entreated the Lord when he was 40 years old. And I, I can't remember where that passage is, but it was many, many decades later, I think 20 years, until he actually had a child. So he was actually asking for a child for many, many years. But when people, when they pray to God for a child these days and they try, generally they're trying for two years, three years, four years. They're not trying very long and praying very long to have a child. But we have this example of Isaac entreating the Lord for many, many, many years and eventually giving birth to Jacob and Esau, um, the, those t twins in um, Genesis uh, 25. Then we have uh, Rachel, who is uh, one of Jacob's wives, who was barren, and then she ended up giving birth to Joseph, and then eventually Benjamin in, Ge in Genesis 30. Uh, we have Manoah's wife. Now, Manoah's wife was the mother of Samson. Um, Samson was, you know, the, the, the Nazarite, very strong uh, guy that we know. That's in Judges 13. So she was barren, but eventually gave birth to Samson. And then we have Hannah, who is Elkanah's wife in 1 Samuel 1, where she was barren, and then she gave birth to the prophet Samuel. So there's another lady there that was barren, but eventually gave birth. In 2 Kings 4, we've got the Shunammite woman, where the miracle that Elisha performed, that she was old, her husband was old as well, and Elisha uh, did a miracle and allowed her to get pregnant. And you remember her son died, and then Elisha brought her son back to life. So that's number six. And then number seven is Elizabeth, the uh, mother of John the Baptist. So they were very well stricken in years as well. And then they gave birth to, uh, or she gave birth to John the Baptist in Luke 1. So I'll put all those verses up uh, next to these references on the blog post if you want to go back and, and take a look at them. The other one that I've heard mentioned is, is Michal, which is uh, David's, one of Saul's uh, daughter who David married but I don't know so much if she was barren or David just didn't sleep with her anymore um, because she obviously made fun of him when he was bringing back the Ark of the Covenant and dancing and everything so she didn't give birth to any children but I don't know whether it was because she was cursed or whether David just no longer went in unto her but I don't think it was because she was just barren but I put that there so I did want to end that last sermon on that note, just as an encouragement to say, hey, you know, even ladies that are struggling to get pregnant, every woman in the Bible where it's mentioned that she was barren or stricken in years did give birth to a lady. So that's something that we can, um, uh, that can encourage us for those of us who are struggling in that area. Now going on to the topic of today's sermon. So, you know, when we talk about birth control, or contraceptives. Now there is a difference between birth control and contraceptives just because birth control, if you think about what it's saying, it's controlling the birth. It's whether or not you give birth to a child. Whereas when you think about contraceptives, 
the idea of contraceptives is to stop you from getting pregnant, to stop you from even fertilizing an egg. And there's a big difference because we believe that the Bible teaches that life begins at conception. So if you have a method of birth control that just prevents a birth, but the baby is already alive, it's already in your womb, then that's murder. And we'll talk about abortion in a moment. So we, we have the question of is using birth control a sin, but in the, in the Christian context, it's not just about preventing a birth because abortion is murder. It's about how to, whether it's right or wrong to prevent a conception. And I'll explain my position on that in a moment. I don't know if my position will shock you guys, but the short, the too long, didn't listen answer is, I don't believe using contraceptives is a sin. And I'll explain um, my position just from Bible verses as I go through this sermon. Now, if any type of contraceptive is used, obviously it has to be something that prevents conception because the Bible clearly teaches that life begins at conception. And I will go to those verses now just to, to show you that. Uh, in Matthew 1, 23. I'm just thinking. And, and one thing I wanted to mention is t today I, I wanted to show a video um, just going over the different abortion procedures. Okay. Now it's, it's not graphic because it's not a, a real version of it. It is an illustration, but I realize some people may not want their kids to see that. So you may want to, Kev, you may want to take your kids out now just because I'm just going to cover some verses and give you some time to get them out. So I'll cover some verses just on uh, showing from the Bible that life begins at conception. And then I want to just show you this video um, just so you get an idea of what it means to be pro-life, how, how these abortion procedures are actually carried out and, and um, see how wicked they are. But in Matthew 1.23, we read here, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now in Isaiah 7.14, this passage is actually a quotation from an Old Testament passage in Isaiah 7, where it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So you can see how in the New Testament passage, when it replaces the word conceive, it replaces it, it with, with child. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Proving that life, according to the Bible, according to God, begins at conception. So once a child is conceived, the Bible defines that as with child, not with fetus or with blastocyst or with blob or with, according to the Quran, clot, a clot of blood or something like that. Um, look at this verse in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 11, 4 and 5. This is the passage where David, you know, he's idle in his kingdom and he commits adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, verse 4, and David sent messengers and took her and she came in unto him. And he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house. And, the, and look at this. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. So even Bathsheba understood that once she had conceived, there was a child living inside her womb. It wasn't just a blob of tissue that didn't have any life. So very, very clear according to the Bible that life begins at conception. And that's why any form of birth control or contraceptive, or it wouldn't be a contraceptive, any form of birth control that kills a child after conception is not a legitimate way of birth control, right? Because you're actually just committing murder. And you know, some forms of birth control, some of these uh, pills actually cause silent abortions, like the morning after pill uh, procedures or medications that you take after you actually get pregnant, after you fertilize, these are not legitimate ways of using birth control because you're just killing the baby that's inside you. You're not actually preventing the baby from being conceived. You know, there are some birth control pills that actually kill a child, you know, up to five weeks. We're going to watch this video in a second where the, the, the child already has fingers. I mean, it, it's a, it, literally, it's a little human being and they're just taking hormone pills and different pills that just sucks the life out of that child and doesn't allow it to live. 
Now, I personally would never use any contraceptives that are hormonal or medical just because they do mess with your body. You know, they, you know when you take these birth control pills, they do mess with your menstrual cycle. Um, they, do, they could overstimulate hormonal production in your body and have potential side effects. Um, some birth control pills might actually create a lining in your womb where the baby cannot implant and that can uh, take some time to work its way out of your body. So, you know, if somebody is going to use contraceptives, probably the mechanical methods are, are, are better ways to do it, or the natural methods if you prefer that. But I want to show you this video because, you know, even I, before I saw this video, was not aware of how abortions are actually, are actually done. So it's, it's quite a good educational video. It's, it's about 10 minutes long, so it is long. It goes through all the different ways abortions are done through the different trimesters. Um, so hopefully you're not too freaked out by it, but I think it's very important for us to know these things because you want to know what pro-life actually means. When people say that, uh, so pro-choice actually means. When pe people say they're pro-choice, they're for a woman's right to choose, this is what they're actually supporting. So let's just um, watch this together. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist, and I performed over 1,200 abortions. First, I'm going to describe a first trimester medical abortion. This is a procedure in which the mother swallows pills in order to terminate her baby, and it is performed up to the ninth week of pregnancy. The procedure involves two steps. Step one, at the abortion clinic or doctor's office, the woman takes pills which contain mifepristone, also called RU-46. RU-46 blocks the action of a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is naturally produced in the mother's body to stabilize the lining of the uterus. When RU-46 blocks progesterone, the lining of the mother's uterus breaks down, cutting off blood and nourishment to the baby, who then dies inside the mother's womb. It is important to note that even after it has been taken, it is possible to reverse the effects of RU-46 and save the baby if progesterone is administered. The sooner, the better. Step two. 24 to 48 hours after taking RU-46, the woman takes misoprostol, also called Cytotec, that is administered either orally or vaginally. RU-46 and misoprostol together cause severe cramping, contractions, and often heavy bleeding to force the dead baby out of the woman's uterus. The process can be very intense and painful, and the bleeding and contractions can last from a few hours to several days. While she could lose her baby any time and anywhere during this process, the woman will often sit on a toilet as she prepares to expel the child, which she will then flush. She may even see her dead baby within the pregnancy sac. At nine weeks, for example, the baby will be almost an inch long, and if she looks carefully, she might be able to count the fingers and toes. After she has disposed of her baby, the woman may have bleeding and spotting for several weeks. Bleeding lasts, on average, 9 to 16 days. 8% of women bleed more than 30 days, and 1% require hospitalization because of heavy bleeding. RU-46 is only FDA approved for the first seven weeks of pregnancy. While RU-46 can be used off-label up to nine weeks, the failure rate increases as the pregnancy progresses. At seven weeks, it has a 5% failure rate. At eight weeks, an 8% failure rate, and at nine weeks, a 10% failure rate. If failure occurs, she will usually be offered a surgical abortion. For the mother, medical abortion often causes abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, and heavy bleeding. <laughs> Maternal deaths have occurred, most frequently due to infection and undiagnosed ectopic pregnancy. First trimester surgical abortion called suction BNC, facilitation and curatage. This is the most frequently performed abortion and is used typically from 5 to 13 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a speculum like this. This is placed inside the vagina and opened using this screw on the side, allowing the abortionist to see the cervix, the entrance to the uterus. The cervix acts as a gate that stays closed for the duration of pregnancy, protecting the baby until it is ready for birth. The abortionist uses a series of metal rods called dilators, like these, 
which increase in thickness and inserts them into the cervix to dilate it, gaining access to the inside of the uterus where the baby resides. The baby has a heartbeat, fingers, toes, arms, and legs, but its bones are still weak and fragile. The abortionist takes a suction catheter like this one. This is a 14 French suction catheter. It's clear plastic, about nine inches long, and it has a hole through the center. It is inserted through the cervix into the uterus. <coughs> the suction machine is then turned on with a force 10 to 20 times more powerful than your household vacuum cleaner. The baby is rapidly torn apart by the force of the suction and squeezed through this tubing down into the suction machine, followed by the placenta. Though the uterus is mostly emptied at this point, one of the risks of a suction DNC is incomplete abortion. Essentially, pieces of the baby or placenta left behind. This can lead to infection or bleeding. In an attempt to prevent this, the abortionist uses a curette to scrape a lining of the uterus. The curette is basically a long handled curved blade. Once the uterus is empty, the speculum is removed and the abortion is complete. The risks of suction DNC include perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, potentially damaging intestine, bladder, and nearby blood vessels, hemorrhage, infection, and in rare instances, even death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. Second trimester surgical abortion called dilatation and evacuation, or D&E. A D&E is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum, like this one, that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late-term abortion. Late-term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminaria. Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand, from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on, and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. The babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or a leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta, and any leftover parts of the baby with a curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a significant risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, with possible damage to the bowel, bladder, and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can even lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. Finally, I'm going to describe a third trimester induced abortion, which is performed at 25 weeks to term. At this point, the baby is almost fully developed and viable meaning he or she could survive outside the womb if the mother were to go into labor prematurely. Because the baby is so large and developed, this procedure takes three or four days to complete. On day one, the abortionist uses a large needle to inject a drug called digoxin. Digoxin is generally used to treat heart problems, but a high enough dosage of digoxin will cause 
fatal cardiac arrest. The abortionist inserts the needle with the digoxin through the women's abdomen or through her vagina and into the baby, targeting either the head, torso, or heart. The baby will feel it. Babies at this stage feel pain. When the needle pierces the baby's body and the digoxin takes effect, the life of the baby will end. The abortionist then inserts multiple sticks of seaweed called laminaria into the woman's cervix. They will slowly open up the cervix for delivery of a stillborn baby. While the woman waits for the laminaria to dilate her cervix, she carries her dead baby inside of her for two to three days. On day two, the abortionist replaces the laminaria and may perform a second ultrasound to ensure the baby is dead. If the child is still alive, he administers another lethal dose of digoxin. The woman then goes back to where she is staying while her cervix continues to dilate. If she goes into labor and is unable to make it to the clinic in time, she will give birth at home or in a hotel. In this case, she may be advised to deliver her baby into a bathroom toilet. The abortionist then comes to remove the baby and clean up. If she can make it to the clinic, she will do so during her severest contractions and deliver her dead son or daughter. If the baby does not come out whole, then the procedure becomes a DNE, a dilation and evacuation, and the abortionist uses clamps and forceps to dismember the baby, piece by piece. Once the placenta and all the body parts have been removed, the abortion is complete. Late-term abortions have a high risk of hemorrhage, lacerations, and uterine perforations, as well as a risk of maternal death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a pre-born child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the preborn. Thank you for your time. I will no longer do any more abortions. When you finally figure out killing the baby that big for money is wrong, and it doesn't take you too long to figure out it doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this big or this big or maybe even this big, it's all the same. And I haven't done any since then and I never will. I don't know about you guys, when I first watched those videos, it just sent chills down my spine, just knowing that's what they do. Um, you know, like abortion is just so wicked. I mean, like, how can anybody watch that and think pro being pro-choice is fine, being, doing abortions is fine? Um, you know, if somebody's, if somebody's a Christian and they're pro-choice, shame on them. I mean, shame on you for, for supporting uh, this. But, you know, you, you might be wondering, like, why, why, why am I showing this video this morning? Like, what, what's the purpose behind it? Well, the reason why I wanted you guys to see this is because I wanted you to see the reality of what an abortion is, what it actually involves. Um, you know, this is what it means for somebody. When somebody says, I'm pro-choice, you know, I'm for a woman's right to choose, this is what they're advocating for. And I wanted you guys to just see that for yourselves so that, that you'll hate it as much as I do. You know, because when you realize this is what they're doing, like, how can anybody watch that and just not think that it's just so barbaric? You're just tearing apart a baby inside the womb. Um, I, you know, there was this other video that I watched on YouTube, which was by the same organization, where they actually showed people um, that video. I think they showed them the second trimester DNA evacuation uh, procedure. And um, they asked the person, you know, are you pro-life, are you pro-choice, are you neither? And the people started off saying, oh yeah, I'm pro-choice, you know, I think a woman should have a right to choose and it's her own body. And then they watched that video and actually changed their mind. You know, they asked them, you know, are you still pro-choice after watching this video? And they're like, oh, that's, that's kind of barbaric, you know, I think it's, you know, maybe I'm not pro-choice anymore. So I think videos like that are very effective to educate people on the reality of what an abortion really is because you know it's like something when you're not really uh, part of it you don't really know what goes on you don't really see it for what it is and it reminds me of just this other video that I watched of um, of these foodies you know foodies are people that go and eat out at restaurants and then they you know give a review on the atmosphere and all that sort of stuff 
and these five like sort of uh, metrosexual looking you know foodies go to a farm and actually kill their own chicken and it was just funny because to them it was just such such a traumatic experience but you know because they're so disconnected from the reality of where their food comes from they were so traumatized by it um, you know and, and I'm not comparing obviously humans to animals but I'm I'm saying that you know the fact is that if we distance ourselves from the reality of what is happening out there it'll be a lot more traumatic um, than just knowing what is going on and just numbing yourself to it you know I wanted to just compare you know what we saw there just to this verse in Jeremiah and and this phrase is is, is three times in Jeremiah I found it but I just wanted to read it to you it says here because they have forsaken me and have estranged this place and have burnt incense in, in it unto other gods whom neither they nor their fathers have known nor the kings of Judah and have filled this place with the blood of innocence and this is what countries that allow abortion do they fill the country with the blood of innocence it says they have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal which I commanded them not nor spake it neither came it into my mind see so there are things that people do that are just so abhorrent that God has not even even thought of these things it's not that God didn't know about them because obviously God is om omniscient he knows all things but he didn't come up with these things it wasn't in God's mind to come up with these evil things I mean who came up with the idea hey you know let's 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 figure out a way to get into a woman's womb so we can crush and pull a baby apart I mean this is not something that God came up with and this is how God thinks of these things. He's like, I didn't command this. I didn't speak about it. I didn't even come into my mind. The evil things that man does uh, to innocent babies. I mean, look here. They are offering their babies through fire unto Baal. It, wicked. I mean, this abortion is just as wicked as what um, the people were doing in the Old Testament in Jeremiah's <laughs> days. And if you have time, go look on YouTube and, and look up a live action and, and you, can, you can actually listen to uh, Dr. Levitino, which is that guy, his testimony. It's like a 30, 35 minute video, how he actually changed from being a pro-choice abortion doctor to being a pro-life advocate and now you know, campaigning against abortion. Um, but to give, it, to give you the story in a nutshell, it's quite interesting because you know, he, he was doing all these abortions and I think at first it never really sat well with him but then you know, he just soldiered through it and just, you know, just thought, hey, you know, a woman should have a right to do this, so he supported it. It wasn't, until, it wasn't until he tried to have a child. So he got married, he wanted to have a child and then he realized that his wife was not getting pregnant, so it was actually difficult for them to have a child. So then they were looking at adoption options. And it sort of dawned on him, here I am day in and day out killing babies and I'm trying to look for a baby to adopt. So eventually he found a lady that, you know, uh, was, was giving, giving birth to a baby. I think it was an unwanted pregnancy and he was able to adopt that child. So that already, I think, started his change in perspective on what he thought about children and the whole abortion process. But it wasn't until... Um, I think he had some friends over at his house and his children were playing in the front yard that the daughter that he adopted actually was hit by a car. And because him and his wife were in the medical field, they were not able to save the child. It was that traumatic experience that changed the way he looked at the baby in the, the plate after he had ripped it all apart because he no longer saw that as just a fetus and then as an abortion procedure. He saw that as somebody's daughter or somebody's son that he had just killed. So I think it's interesting that it required something like that for somebody to change their perspective, for somebody to rethink it. And I, and I have two thoughts. It's, it's sort of like, you know, that's the reason why when we pray for people to get saved, we pray for something to happen in their life. You know, maybe, it's, maybe something traumatic has to happen for them to wake up and think about eternity. But also I had the thought is, hey, does God need something like that to happen to you to get you moving? You know, you, you're living for yourself. You don't care about the things of God if that's how you are. Hey, does something like that need to happen to you before you wake up and smell the roses and say, hey, that's, my life is not about me. My life's not about this world. I'm going to do something for eternity. I'm going to do something for God. I don't want God's chastising hand coming on me and something terrible like that happening in order to get my attention. So um, 
you know, take heed to things like that. And hey, if you're, you're not doing what you know you ought to be doing, start doing it before God has to make something like that happen in your life to get you to change. I wanted to just share a couple of things as well, just with the legal uh, uh, position right now of abortion in Australia. If you didn't know, abortion is actually legal in all states of Australia. There isn't one state of Australia where abortion isn't, isn't legal, but different states have their different criteria on where they allow an, an abortion. And, and the most uh, liberal uh, state in Australia that allows abortion on demand at any age inside the womb is the ACT. And I just got these snippets from, um, from, from Wikipedia, but listen, listen to this, in the ACT, Reference to abortion as a criminal offence were repealed by the Crimes Abolition of Offence of Abortion Act 2002. Before then, abortion law was for many years governed by case law under sections 82 84 of the Crimes Act 1900 of New South Wales, section 9 of the Human Rights Act 2004, confirms that pre-born human life do not enjoy the right of life. Full-term abortions on demand are legal in the ACT as there are no gestational limits. So basically what that's saying is there was a change I think in um, 2002 to the Crimes Act of 1900 saying that having an abortion is no longer illegal, it's no longer a criminal offence and then it wasn't until 2004 part of the Human Rights Act, so this whole a woman's right to her own body, where the ACT repealed a criminal offence to abortion completely. And now a woman can have an abortion at any stage of her pregnancy. Now that was only in 2004. Uh, you might be wondering what the New South Wales position on abortion is. I'll read that. It says, in New South Wales, abortions are unlawful under sections 82, 84 of the Crimes Act, 1900. But the interpretation of the law is subject to the Levine ruling from R.V. Wald. It's funny how that's pretty close to R.V. Roe versus Wade in the United States, but R.V. Wald of 1971, itself derived from the Victorian Manhattan ruling, which held, in a, which held an abortion to be legal if a doctor found any, look at this, if a doctor found any economic, social, or medical ground or reason that an abortion was required to, ev to avoid a serious danger to the pregnant woman life, woman's life or to her physical or mental health at any point during pregnancy. So it's saying again, in the Crimes Act 1900, abortion was illegal, it was considered a criminal offence, but in 1974 they made a Levine ruling to say, ah, well if it affects the woman negatively, economically, socially, mentally, then a doctor could say that this abortion could be done. This was expanded by the Kirby ruling of 1994. Now look at this, like this is not really that long ago. RV Wald was 1971, ACT changed their ruling in 2002. Um, this is 1994, so I was in year four in 1994, which extended the period during which health concerns might be considered from the duration of pregnancy to any period during the woman's life, even after the birth of the child. So the Levine ruling was saying that, hey, a doctor could consider the mental and economic and social health of the woman up until she gives birth. But then the Kirby ruling said, no, 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 it's not just how, how she's affected up to the time of birth. It, it, it's, it, it may affect her up until the rest of her life. So a woman could say, oh, I just can't, ha I can't handle having children. It's too stressful for me. That's why I want to kill the child. And that could be a, re a legitimate reason, according to that ruling, for why to abort the child. I mean, where does it end? says here, this arguably, and uh, Wikipedia even acknowledges this, we, this arguably precludes any successful prosecutions for illegal abortions. So that's basically saying, well, with that ruling, then how can anybody deny anyone of an abortion? Because you just have to say, it's going to stress me out somehow, either economically or socially. It says, despite this, in 2006, a doctor, Suman Sood, was convicted of two accounts of performing an illegal abortion and look, listen to this, this is why. Where she failed to inquire as to whether a lawful reason for performing the abortion did exist. So the only reason why somebody was actually prosecuted for performing an illegal abortion is because the doctor did not ask, hey, is this going to stress you out somehow? They just did it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So that's, 
the law in New South Wales. So you just in New South Wales, you just have to prove that it's going to have some negative social or economic effect on the woman any time in her life, and then she can have an abortion up until um, uh, uh, up until birth. Obviously, after birth, there's no question that 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 it's murder. Now, a couple of thoughts on those things. You know, these laws didn't actually get passed that long ago. I mean, these were within our lifetime. And yes, most of us were children at the time, but what does that say? That means the Christians in the generation before us, they were the ones that were asleep at the wheel, not doing anything about it. You know, letting these laws pass, because generally it's not the majority of people that pass these laws. It's just enough political pressure that a politician will appease the people that are bugging them. Because we know that the majority, probably the majority of people, if they saw those videos on abortion, they would not be for that. I mean, you might, you might be able to argue, somebody might think, okay, well, before five weeks or before three weeks when it doesn't really resemble a human, you know, somebody might have an emotional detachment from that. But how can you see the second and third trimester abortion and think that's okay and think that that's fine? I don't think really anybody would if they knew the reality, reality of it. But you know when it comes to legal things, and I know some of us in here have talked about these things, you know, you often ask the question, can we make a difference? You know, I honestly believe we can make a difference because these people that are campaigning to change the laws, they made a difference and they're not even the majority. You know, it's like same-sex marriage. Like, they're not even the majority and they're making a difference. So imagine if people that actually believe the right thing just got involved somehow, supported movements that supported the Christian movement, you know, didn't go to the election booths just ignorant, voting for Labour, voting for Liberal, both parties supporting these sorts of things. You know, maybe we would make a difference if we would just be informed. And that's why I share these videos and I talk about these things. Um, look here in Acts uh, 17. I'll just show you this verse. It says here, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Now, the, the disciples in the early church, they were going against persecution. They were going against the norm. And they made a huge difference. You know, look at what the legacy that they left us. Now, just imagine if Christians would get involved in the things pertaining to this world. We could definitely make a difference. Don't buy into the lie that we cannot change things or turn the tide. Uh, let me show you this verse in Jude. Jude here it says here but ye beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith praying in the holy ghost keep yourselves in the love of god looking for the mercy of our lord jesus christ unto eternal life and of some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire hating, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh now i know we can make a difference in somebody's salvation when we preach them of the gospel um but every time we do that, we're making a difference. We do make a difference. And we just get enough people saved. We influence enough people. That's just going to turn the tide. That's all it is. You know, politics is just about how many people believe, believe something, how many people support something, how many people are educated about it. If we can turn the tide, that's why things can change. But if we just have this frame of mind that we can't make a difference, then we won't necessarily do what it takes to make a difference. And sometimes I wonder... You know, as Christians, sometimes you hear people say, we're not going to make a difference. You just wonder, are we just consoling ourselves because we're too lazy and we're too selfish to actually do what it takes to make a difference? Do you know what I mean? Because it takes work. It takes study. It takes work. It takes talking to people to actually make a difference in this world, even with, even with salvation. You know, it makes a difference to get people saved in this area because it takes you getting out there, opening your Bible, preaching the gospel to people, but then people, you know, it's like with salvation, people just say, oh, you know, we don't make a difference. We, you know, people don't want to hear the gospel. Are you just telling yourself that because you are too selfish, you're too lazy to, to do what it takes? You know, I get an email from this political organization called GetUp. And GetUp are uh, like the most left-wing, liberal, political lobbying movement there is. And sometimes I see their numbers of volunteers. You know, because they say they've got this many volunteers in this state and this many volunteers, and they're constantly recruiting volunteers. I just think if they, can, if they can do that, I mean, we're all our volunteers. We're all the Christian volunteers, you know, helping for the cause. Um, 
So it's just sad that, you know, that's, that's why they're effective. I don't think it's just a natural, yes, there's a natural progression into sin. Yes, and we do have to work harder, but it's not impossible. They're affecting change in a country like Australia because they're working hard at it. They're out there door knocking, campaigning, setting up marketing strategies, using their talents. You know, I'm sure a lot of people volunteer at GetUp to do the accounts, to design their banners, to design their emails. They have people investing those skills. Do we do that? Are we looking at ways that we, we have talents, we have abilities that we can do? Are we looking at ways, how can God use my abilities to make a change in this world? Or do we just use it to make a living and then the money that we make, we just spend it on ourselves? You know, think about these things. What can you do? Even in this church, hey, you want this church to flourish? You want this church to do well? Think about how you can get involved. What can I do different? Is it, you know, don't just think, oh, I, I, I wish we just did this. You know, like when people talk in church, I wish we did this. I wish we did that. Or somebody should do this. Well, the reason why we don't have it in church is because nobody's doing it. You know, I can't do everything. And, you know, sometimes I, I wish I had the managerial skills to, to, to mobilize everyone and just like utilize everyone's talents. But, you know, I don't, I just, I'm just not that talented. I don't, I don't necessarily have that skill. I'm doing what I can to get things going. But, hey, if we had a body of believers here that had a proactive mind and thought, hey, I have this skill. Hey, maybe that's something I can do. And then you approach me with it. Hey, let's do it. And that's already happened in our church where somebody's seen a need and said, hey, I'll take that on. And I say, hey, let's run with it. And you know, one example is Alex. Alex has some skills in social media. So he said to me, hey, why don't I start an Instagram account? Why don't I start getting some posts going on Facebook? Great, let's do it. Because I don't always have the time to think about these things. And if all of us got involved, hey, that's when we'll start to see some change. We'll start to affect some change. So of course, we can make a difference. We make a difference, but look at this. It says, others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And you see, sometimes that's the problem. It's our flesh. Our flesh is what is stopping us from making a difference. And the Bible says here, it's not just hating the flesh, it's hating the garment even spotted by the flesh. It's hating something that's even touched flesh. That's how much we ought to hate the things of the flesh in order to make this difference. So do we? Do we just console ourselves? I sometimes feel like that. Sometimes we just console ourselves. Like sometimes I just say, oh, you know, it's just going to happen. That's just what's going to happen just because, you know, maybe I, I, don't, I don't do it enough. You know, that's why this election period, I'm trying to like do a bit of research into the actual political parties. Because how many of us go to the polls just ignorant? Does, everyone, does anyone even know who they voted for last election? I was talking this, about this with Mel this morning over breakfast. Just saying like, you know, who, who do we even vote for? Do we even know what they stand for? Do we even know how the voting system works? Why don't we know these things? I want to learn how these, know, so how these work so I can at least educate you guys. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to decide who I'm going to vote for and I'm going to tell you guys who I'm going to vote for. But I want to actually make an informed choice this time because I've always just blindly voted for the Christian Democratic Party. But I didn't realize that there are actually other alternatives out there. And the, the party that I'm actually swaying towards is Family First. And I found out about them because you guys might know I've been sort of following the Liberal Democratic Party. They're a libertarian party, um, but they're pro-same-sex marriage and they're pro-abortion. And I was like, oh, do I want to vote for them? Because, you know, they're limited government. They want to get rid of government intrusion and they're really for lowering taxes. You know, but the Christian Democratic Party, like they stand for our principles, but they're like big government as well. Because, and that's the problem with a lot of these Christian political parties, is even though they have a Christian tinge to them, they're still for increased government spending, increased taxes. They just want to spend it on Christian things. You know, I want to spend it on Christian schools and Christian hospitals and things like that. Whereas I would rather those privatized because I don't think government should be in the business of, of services. So anyways, I know this has nothing to do with the sermon, but anyways, I came across David Lionhelm actually partnered up with somebody from Family First to, to create like a voting block in the Senate. Uh, this guy called Bob Day. And people were asking them like, how, Bob Day, how, you from Family First, how are you partnering up with David Lionhelm because you guys obviously oppose each other on social issues. So they decided just to come together on economic issues because they both believe in lower taxes, limited government, less government intrusion. And uh, Bob Day actually tells this funny story of how he tried to develop these, uh, these apartment blocks or these townhouses 
and it was next to a highway and the town planner in the council told him to put up some sound attenuation devices, like a fence to basically block the sound. And he was saying, well, all the other houses along the highway don't have this. Why are you forcing our townhouses to? And he's like, no, nah, you've got to have them if you're going to do a new development. So then he said, well, what about the market? Why can't the market just solve this problem? Because if they, people don't want to live next to a highway, then, then they just don't buy the houses and then it's fine. And then they said, no, they forced him to have these, 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 these fences up there. So anyways, after he finished the development, he put up the sound attenuation devices. It was the Royal Association for the Deaf that bought all 12 townhouses. So he told this story in Parliament and everyone was laughing because it was like, well, so the government basically got him to follow all these regulations and it didn't even matter to the people that actually ended up buying the townhouses. Just as an example of government intrusion. So I'm swinging towards them because I've, I've, I've learned a bit about them and it seems like they're the best choice in terms of actually wanting to limit government. I read some things on their website that they're actually against surrogacy, they're against euthanasia, and they believe that any adoption should only ever go to a married man and woman couple. So just things like that, the fact that they're limited government as well. So um, I'm looking to them this, this election, but I might give you guys some updates about that another time. Um, Now, exceptions to abortions. Now, one thing I want to talk about is, you know, a lot of people, they say, oh, you know, I'm against abortions, but except for these exceptions. And you might have heard some of them before, but one of them, for example, is uh, rape. They'll say in the cases of rape and incest, then, then I think an abortion is okay. Well, my, my, my question is, well, if you have to do that, in that video, in order to have an abortion, why not just adopt the child? You know, why not? Why is an adoption an alternative to just killing the child? Like, even if somebody has been raped, why not kill the rapist? Kill the rapist, but keep the child, give birth to the child, and then adopt the child to somebody else. I mean, everybody already knows you're pregnant. You know, so in terms of your 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 reputation is already tarnished. Why tarnish it even more by killing the child that's inside you? You know, at least give birth to the child, adopt it, maybe allow a way for that child to be given back to the real mother if she changes her mind. I don't know. But I don't think rape is an exception to abortion, you know, because there, there are alternatives. Um, same with emotional health, financial issues. You know, it's the same. You could adopt the child. That's not really a justification to murder a child. Uh, another might be, to save the life of the mother. This is another one. To say, well, I'm against abortion unless it, it's, the reason is to save the life of the mother. And this is one thing that's interesting about Dr. Levitino's testimony, if you listen to it later, is he actually says that this, these are not reasons for why a woman should have an abortion. Because think about it. Generally, a pregnancy will affect the life of the mother if it's, if it's early on if that's going to kill the mother, then the baby's going to die anyway, right? Because if the mother's going to die, then the baby's going to die. So let's say you have something like an ectopic pregnancy, where an ectopic pregnancy is when the implant, the baby implants not in the womb, but it implants in one of the fallopian tubes. And that's why it will actually end up killing the mother, because as the baby grows, it can cause a hemorrhage in the fallopian tube and the, the mother will die. So they'll say, oh, in that case, you terminate the baby. Well, I would say in that case, you're not it's not really an abortion, see, because an abortion is when you intentionally end the life of the baby. But if somebody has an atopic pregnancy, the mindset is, oh, I want to save the baby, but even extracting the baby from the mother, the baby can't survive outside the womb. So the, the, you see, the intention is different. When you abort a baby, you say, I just want to kill it because I don't want to have the child. When you do an operation for an ectopic pregnancy, it's different because you're saying, I would like to save the, the life of the child, but if I save the life, if I take the child out of the mother, the baby is going to die anyway. But we're not just going to let the mother die, because if the mother's dead, the baby's not going to survive either. So when it comes to things that are early on in the pregnancy, it's not a question of abortion, it's a question of do we save the life of the mother? Because we can't save the life of the child. You know, we just have to do something to save a life. So it's still a pro-life position, it's not a pro-abortion position. Now when it comes to the point where a baby is actually viable, where 
you know, because it, it only, as far as I understand, it's only when the baby actually gets to the point where it's quite large and is actually viable outside the womb that other complications can occur. And what Dr. Levitino actually explains is, you know, these procedures, if the, life's, if the life of the mother is actually at stake, then why isn't the alternative just to do a cesarean section and deliver the child and try and save the child's life? He's basically saying that there is no reason why there's no, there's no reason ever why we should intentionally just end the life of the baby just to save the mother. Because if the mother is in a life-threatening situation, you need to do something quick, right? You can't just do something that takes three or four days to perform. But if, if one thing you realize about these abortion procedures, when they're in the second and third trimester, these are not things that are just done overnight. They need to prepare the woman. They need to give her drugs. They need to dilate the cervix. She needs to, you know, they need to kill the baby first and then deliver it later. So these are not things that are just done at a whim. And this is why Dr. Levitino is making the case saying there is no reason why you should ever have to intentionally kill a child where you could not otherwise just deliver the child and try and save the child. Um, and I think it makes an interesting point. So I think we can take the stand that in every case abortion is... Um, is murder and there are times where you need to do a procedure to save the mother's life and try and save the child but the child is not of viable age let's go to the law of jealousies in numbers five uh, numbers. Uh, here in numbers five verse eleven And let's just read here. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept closed, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner. And the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled, then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord, and the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put it into the water. Excuse me, the water. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and cover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman, If no man have lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, if, if, if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into, in, go into thy bowels, to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse, and the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand, and shall wave the offering before the Lord, and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar, and afterward shall cause the woman to drink the water. And when he hath made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass that if she be defiled, and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her, and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free, and shall conceive seed. This is the law of jealousies, when a wife goes aside to another instead of her husband, and is defiled. Or when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him, and he be jealous over his wife, and shall set the woman before the Lord, and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. Then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity, and this woman shall bear her iniquity. So I just wanted to read that passage to you, just so you understand what the law of jealousies is and how it works. Basically, it's when a man suspects his wife of 
um, what's the word? Adultery or uh, infidelity? Yeah, infidelity. Um, we, I guess it's adultery, isn't it? Yeah, same thing. So I was looking for that word there. So it's when a man suspects his wife of, of being not loyal to him, infidelity, committing adultery, and he basically, is the spirit of jealousy comes upon him. He can take his wife to the priest and he goes through this ritual of making the bitter water and makes her take an oath. And as she drinks the bitter water, if she has committed adultery, her thigh will swell and her belly will rot. If not, then she's free and she can conceive seed. Now, the reason why I'm bringing up this passage is a lot of people will say that this passage supports abortion. Because they'll say that the woman got pregnant and then she's going to the priest and drinking, drinking the bitter water and because her thigh is rotting, her belly is rotting, her thigh, her thigh is swelling and her belly is rotting, that it causes her to have an abortion. Now, I don't believe this is what this passage is talking about and I'll explain to you why I don't think that. Uh, let's see if I can find that verse again. Uh, so his wife. Yeah, look at verse 13. It says here, And a man lie with her carnally, and he'd be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept closed. So he doesn't know about it. It says, And she be defiled, so she has slept with somebody, and there be no witness against her, so nobody can, can testify that she has slept with another man. But look at this, Neither she be taken with the manner. Now I believe that is talking about the fact that she didn't get pregnant by it. Because if she's pregnant by it, then he knows that she's, she slept with somebody else. Um, so if she's not going to the priest pregnant, because if she was pregnant, then she would, he would already know. Just like Joseph, when he saw Mary with child of the Holy Ghost and she was with child, he knew, hey, this is not my child. He knew that she had committed, or she, he believed that she had committed fornication. He didn't need to take her to the priest to perform this. And also, if you read later on, it says here, uh, after it goes through all the different things, uh, in verse 28, and it says here, And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. So why would it add that bit to say, hey, if she didn't get cursed by the water, now she's free to then go and get pregnant, if she's already pregnant. Because if she's already pregnant and the water didn't kill the baby, then it wouldn't say she's free to go conceive seed. It would say she'd be free to go and have the baby, you know? So uh, I would, you know, people who are trying to take this passage to say, ah, you see, even God allowed abortions to take place and therefore we can just kill any baby. You know, that's even a stretch to say, well, you know, if you don't believe life starts at a certain period to then say, then just kill any baby. Because if you're going to kill a baby inside the womb, what difference is if you kill it outside the womb? I mean, if you're reaching into the womb to kill it, what's the difference if you take it out and kill it? You know, to me, it's just hypocrisy from the legal system. Um, this double standard of, you know, being able to kill a baby uh, not, in, not outside the womb, but not inside the womb. I'm just wondering whether to go on to the next point, because... Uh, It'll probably, that's probably an hour sermon in and of itself. Let's end, let's end it there. I don't, I don't want to preach for another 45 minutes and, and sort of cut into lunch prep time. But, you know, let's recap. So it's very clear that the Bible defines conception as the start of life. You know, therefore a woman shall conceive in the New Testament, in the, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, therefore a woman shall be with child. And that's why any procedure that ends a pregnancy after fertilization is murder. We saw how gruesome it is to actually have an abortion procedure and how many risks are actually involved in having an abortion procedure. And, and really we talked about, you know, there should really be no justification for why a woman should ever have an abortion. You know, number one, you know, why not just keep your legs shut? You know, don't sleep with other people. Don't have the baby in the first place. And then we don't even have to have this question about abortion. I mean, married couples generally want to have children. But even so, once you are pregnant, there's no reason to have an abortion when you can just have the child and adopt the child to a family that will take care of that child. And just the last thing we talked about as well is just the political climate of Australia. And I really do think we should get more involved. I know some people believe that Christians should not be involved in politics. That's not me. You know, I personally believe Christians should be involved in politics. We are commanded to be a salt and a light of this world. 
And this is one way where we can legally affect change. I mean, we vote, we can campaign, we can educate people, we can use our vote to actually make a difference. So let's not be ignorant about the voting process in Australia and let's use our vote to make a difference. And it's funny, I even read something online to say, even though voting is compulsory in Australia, still 30% of people don't vote. Just because, you know, they forget to vote on the day. You know, they forget to go, they get the fine, they just pay the fine. Don't let that be you. You know, you, you have a vote, so use it. You know, it's compulsory anyway. You know, don't, don't, be, don't be fined for not voting. So go and use it and vote for somebody that can actually make a difference in politics. Anyway, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Um, Lord, we thank you for the people that are, 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 are doing more than, and than we are to, to make a difference in this world. I pray, Lord, that that would not remain us. That, Lord, we would get more involved. Not just in politics, Lord. The, the problem is, is if we prioritize politics over the spiritual things, which ultimately can lead to change in a society. So I pray, Lord, that all of us would be soul winners. All of us would educate ourselves on the Bible so that we'd be confident in sharing our values, why we believe what we believe. Um, and Lord, we would also just gain wisdom in a, in a secular sense so that we can also convince those that aren't convinced that the Bible is the Word of God and have arguments there as well. So we pray, Lord, for our church. Pray, Lord, that this church will continue to grow, that our influence will grow. And um, pray, Lord, that you would use us. Help us to identify talents that can be used to serve you, Lord, and to um, help get the word out, be more effective. And um, I just pray, Lord, that we would have our eyes set on eternity, things that are eternal, not temporal. Well, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.